This Pikachu is special. You see, he doesn't know Thundershock or Tail Whip or any of that nonsense. Oh no. Thanks to the power of these two Game Shark codes, this Pikachu will only ever know one skill. Welcome to RPG Challenge Runs, and today we ask ourselves, can you be Pokemon Yellow with only Metronome on a single Pikachu? Metronome causes the user to perform a move at random, chosen from a pool of every move in the entire game, which is of course incredibly unreliable. Also, no items in battle, no exploiting glitches, and no selecting skills other than Metronome, meaning if we ever mimic or transform into an enemy Pokemon, we must reset the game. And yes, we're allowed to carry HM users for Cutsurf, etc. to advance the story, but those Pokemon may not be used in combat. Let's go! We've named our Pikachu Setzer, brownie points for those who understand the reference, and this first tutorial fight against our rival isn't going very well. His Eevee is hitting hard while we get stuck in a cycle of rage. Needless to say, we get absolutely obliterated. <laughs> the only things we can take out are these level 2 Rattatas, because even Pidgeys are too strong for us. <laughs> Buckle up people, because this one's going to be fun. The other problem we encounter is that we can't struggle, meaning once our 10pp for Metronome runs out, we're also forced to reset the game. This essentially sets a turn timer on every single encounter, meaning longer battles against opponents with several Pokemon will be bloody tough. At level 9, we try the optional rival encounter on Route 22. Spearow is super easy as we roll an early Thunder Punch for that same type attack bonus, but against Eevee, things are moving much slower. We're raging again, but will it be enough? Come on. Oh, we were so close. Second attempt, and sets us faffing about with random moves that aren't really doing anything while Spearow just sleeps through it. But it's soon down to a sky attack. <laughs> Both of us are faffing around, and then... Oh, yeah, we're out of PP. Third attempt, and Spearow takes a quick trip to the Persona 5 Velvet Room. <laughs> A critical rock slide deals a huge chunk of damage to Eevee, but it's heavily focusing on lowering our defense and accuracy. Everything is just failing to land until we finally connect with a drill peck. And how exactly does a Pikachu with no beak go about pecking, you may ask? Uh, don't know. <laughs> Let's just move on, eh? After raiding all of the loot from the Viridian Forest, we find the guy who it all belonged to. But should we give it all back to him? Quick Pikachu, make a run for it! <laughs> Whew. Oh, that was close. Time for the first of Kanto's eight gym leaders, Brock. On the first try, we get stuck in another rage loop until we're tackled down by his first Pokemon, Geodude. Bide helps us on the next try, where we store damage dealt to us and fire it back for massive damage, one-shotting the thing dead. Nice. It's a shame we're not so lucky against the Onyx, and we're soon out of PP. Third try, we roll a Mimic which forces us to reset because of the rules we outlined at the beginning. Are we really getting bad luck here, or was Brock always this strong? <laughs> Fourth round, we kick things off with a double payday, but even an Earthquake isn't enough to take this thing down. Finally, we have this run. Bubble and Boomerang easily wipe out the Geodude, more on that move in a minute, but we're at low HP. Thankfully, it's perfect timing for this level up and super fang combo, and the rock snake just sits there while we beat his face in. <laughs> Job done. The fight was epic and super close, but I know a fight you're all actually wanting to see. Youngster Joey and his comfy shorts. Sorry to announce that it was pretty uneventful. His snake backwards gave us a little bit of trouble, but nothing we couldn't handle. What did you think about that fight, Pikachu? Meh, seems happy enough. <laughs> we soon encounter our next problem. One that has the potential to completely destroy this run. Disable. This Lassus Jigglypuff is the first time we've encountered the move. But basically, if we get hit by this thing, then we're forced to reset the game, potentially losing a ton of progress. It's also a painful reminder to be constantly saving the game, especially around trainers who may have a drowsy or hypno or something. Hey, what do you mean, that's it? It took us half an hour of repeatedly resetting the game in order to beat you. When passing through Mount Moon, we chose the Dome Fossil. I knew if I didn't say what I took, you'd all like... <laughs> I can't do it. 
Anyway, we're up against Team Rocket now and kick things off with a vice grip before getting repeatedly choked to death. Setsu here certainly wasn't a fan of that, so we decided to do the same back to him, but with fire and stab him. Wow, that was uh, that was actually pretty brutal. Meowth's next, but he forgot to wear a face mask and soon succumbs. Finally, <coughs> goes down to a confusion and pin missile, and we end the fight with just 6 HP. Wow. Time for Gym Leader number 2, Misty. For the first few turns, neither of us are really doing much damage, but then this happens. Petal Dance is incredibly overpowered and is used for several consecutive turns for the cost of only 1 PP and a bit of confusion. Against Starmie, when knocked down to 1 HP, surely she's gonna wipe us out, but instead... Oh, okay, she's stupid, she's dead. That's 931 XP in the bag. Time for Rival Fight 3, and this guy really isn't messing around anymore. He has a whopping 4 Pokemon, meaning we can only afford to spare 2.5 metronomes on each of them. Spearow goes down easily, but Sancho drops our accuracy by 2 stages, which could be catastrophic for us. After our Razor Wind fails to connect with Rattata, we land a critical water gun, so a simple scratch is enough to finish it off. Time for the main event, and oh. We're out of PP. Well, time to reset. We were trying this fight again and again for the best part of 25 minutes, including this run where we got so close to victory only for RN Jesus to abandon us when we needed him most. We do eventually have this run, with Barrage and Fly defeating Spiro, Sanchiru going down to a double earthquake while not lowering our accuracy at all, Ratnata getting wiped out by a sky attack, and Eevee facing the business end of a crit razor leaf thunder combo. <laughs> Whew. After dealing with the shenanigans of Bill's house, we defeat the thief who ransacked our poor couple's home in order to get back the TM that he stole. But should we give it back to him? Quick Pikachu, make a run for it! <laughs> hey, as a kid, did you ever wonder about this guy and his Machop? Like, if his house would ever get built? I'm pretty sure he's still building it in Gold, Silver, Crystal, which takes place years after the original generation of games. Hmm. Come on then, guys, let's see your best fan theories about the Machop guy down in the comments. Did his house ever get built? Did he run off with Nurse Joy? Did his Machop get sick of doing all the work while he just stood there AFK so waited until he slept and then budgeoned him to death with a tyre from the Mew truck near the SSN? <laughs> anyway, after Nintendo teaches kids some important life lessons, it's time to hop on board. We can only complete one cabin at a time before needing to return to the Pokemon Center, so clearing this place takes a very long time. We're soon up against our rival who claims to have caught 40 Pokemon. <laughs> what a load of BS. He only brings four into battle with him. It's a very similar setup to last time because he hasn't improved much. A critical psychic takes down Spearow, Rattata's down to a dizzy punch, and after we hit level 35, Sancho gets kicked in the face. That just leaves Eevee, who is a pathetic level 20, and so falls to a simple Bone Club. Job done. With that, we grab our first HM, Cut, which allows us to, well, cut down certain skinny trees blocking our path. But Pikachu can't learn Cut, and if we're not allowed to use items in battle, then we have no way of throwing a Pokeball to catch a Pokemon that can learn Cut, right? Well, thankfully here in Yellow version, there's a workaround. You see, this guy north of Cerulean City is happy to just hand over a Charmander, so long as we agree to take care of it. Oh yes, we'll take good care of you. <laughs> Anyway, after dealing with Lieutenant Surge's bin puzzle, we go up against the man himself. Here's our setup going in for those who are interested. Surge only has one Pokemon, a level 28 Raichu. After we finish binding, the thing kicks us in the cranium for massive damage. Just a few turns later, and we have fallen. Second attempt, and we kick things off with a critical crab hammer. Nice. I have to say, our critical luck has been pretty good so far this game. Anyway, he's down to a simple tri-attack, and we can push on through everyone's favourite part of Gen 1, Rock Tunnel. <laughs> like, come on, name one place you hated more than Rock Tunnel as a kid. <laughs> it's even more hellish in this run, where we basically have to fight one trainer, come out to heal up, go in to fight the next trainer, come out to heal up, again and again and again. 
You don't want to sit through that, so let's talk about what we found in Celadon City. This awesome PP up. This boosts the PP of Metronome by 2, meaning we now have more sustainability and longer fights. Nice! We boost calciums and proteins to boost Pikachu's damage output and push onto the fourth gym leader, Erika. She's the grass type specialist and her tangler here is super tanky. Even at level 45, we just can't get past it, let alone the rest of her party. There's only one thing for it. We need to grind some more. We head to the Game Corners Team Rocket Hideout because we kind of need to clear this place out anyway, so we're killing two birds with one stone here. We grab the PP up, do a bit of spin to win, knock out some grunts and head down to the Giovanni boss fight. I expected this to be a tough fight, but it was actually super easy because we're <laughs> kind of over leveled. We're mostly not very effective against the first couple of months, but they eventually go down with 7 metronome PP remaining. Persian is last, so we unleash a Stab Thunder for massive damage, wiping out the last of his team. That's one Sylph Scope in the bag. Let's see if things go any better against Erika now. Tangler is up first, but all of our Petal Dance Thrashing gets it below half. From there, we get really good Confusion look, so we can take it down with a super effective Fire Spin. Things are looking great until... Oh. Well, looks like we're resetting again. <laughs> I tried the fight a few more times, but wasn't getting anywhere, so maybe it's time for Chapter 2 of the Team Rocket subplot, which involves going up the tower in Lavender Town. The rival fight here was actually pretty easy, despite him now having access to 5 Pokemon. We slap the bird, electrocute the fox, thrash the uh, magnet, and the uh, shrew, and one shot the Eevee for good measure. Damn, thrash is so damn strong! <laughs> Gotta hope we roll that move more often. The ghosts here are kind of annoying since only a small fraction of Metronome's moves can actually damage them. But thankfully this heal pad aka Purified Protected Zone acts like a Pokemon Center and can be used quickly and easily between each fight. We then use the Sylph Scope on Cubone's mother who was a bit more tanky than I expected but it still went down all the same. Not much to report from Jesse and James here but I'll let the fight play out anyway. It did get quite tense towards the end due to the infliction of poison, but we managed to hit level 50 and obtain the Poker Flute. Oh, and yep, we did manage to make it back to the Pokemon Center before dying to the poison. <laughs> Again, time for Erika. Surely our damage output is high enough now. Well, in short, yes. Fly wipes out two of her three Pokemon, and the final contestant, Gloom, goes down to a Drill Peck. Oh, wow, we got really lucky there. We also take on the leader of the Fighting Dojo Optional Gym. The first attempt is going swimmingly until Pikachu transforms and we have to reset. On the second attempt, we start with Leech Seed but get quite low before KOing the Hitmonlee with an Ice Punch. Meanwhile, the Chan goes down to a critical waterfall. Very nice. Back to the Team Rocket subplot, Chapter 3. There's a mandatory rival fight here in Saffron City that is notoriously difficult, with some people claiming it's one of the toughest fights in the entire game, and I'd be inclined to agree with them. Sandslash is out first and goes down to a critical sky attack, but not before wiping almost half of our health off the screen. Ouch! Magneton is down in just a couple of turns, as is Ninetales, which goes down to a critical blizzard. Things are looking promising, but we're at red health. Oh wait, a leech life, nice. But then, yep, Disable stops us dead in our tracks by forcing a hard reset. Oh, I tried this fight on repeat for almost an hour, but that first run was the furthest that I actually got. We just don't have enough damage output, so there's only one thing for it. We need to grind some more. Cycling Road is perfect for weak mobs who offer decent XP and cash rewards. In Fuchsia City, we immediately go up against Koga, who is the 5th gym leader. Well, 5th or 6th, depending on the order you tackle them. Or even 4th gym leader, I suppose. Wait, is it possible to fight him 3rd after just Brock and Surge? Hmm. Well, anyway, as you probably guess from the footage here, we were not having a good time. But after 20 minutes, we finally had this run. Venonat 1 goes down to a critical double edge, whereas Venonat 2 is a bit more tricky, requiring a combination of Ember, Tackle and Confusion to finish it off. 
then in a three <laughs> wow some of the gym leaders are super boring in yellow like at least his team was more varied in the other games <laughs> But yeah, it died to a Thunderbolt, and Venomoth isn't far behind. The Soul Badge boost sets his defense and lets us surf around on water. But before we can go on ahead, we still have some unfinished business in Saffron City. 45 minutes. That's how long we kept fighting this guy on repeat. But I refused to back down. We have to get past this guy. Finally, we had this run. While it plays out, I'd like to take a moment to say that I know a lot of you watching will be Pokemon fans who've never seen any of my videos before, but we do challenge runs of all kinds of RPGs, Final Fantasy, Dragon Quest, Persona, Tales of Rise, you name it. So if that sounds like something you'd be interested in, I'd appreciate you clicking subscribe, and obviously liking the video as a way of demonstrating that you want to see more Pokemon content. Thanks everyone, I'm still quite new to this whole YouTube thing, so I really appreciate the support. Anyway, after Vaporeon gets chopped in half, we grab a Lapras and teach it Surf. Again, it won't be involved in any combat and is therefore acceptable according to the rules. Time for a rematch against the Team Rocket boss Giovanni. And <laughs> he's definitely toughened up a bit since last time we met him. We managed to get his final Pokemon Nidoqueen down to low health before running out of steam. Second attempt, Nidorino's down to a Thunder Punch, Persian's down to a Flamethrower's Burn, and after hitting level 64, we're up against the much more tanky Rhyhorn. Thankfully, it's double weak to grass, and therefore Razor Leaf wipes it out. Again, that just leaves Nidoqueen. Acid Belly scratches her, and Sonic Boom isn't doing much either. We're getting super unlucky by repeatedly rolling low damage or pointless stat boosting moves until we whip up a whirlwind to deal massive damage with Razor Wind. That's one useless Master Ball in the bag. Hey Pikachu, what did you think of that last fight? <laughs> couldn't have said it better myself. Time for Psychic user Sabrina in the 6th gym. Abra is of course a complete joke and we even convert ourselves to Psychic type while we're at it. Next up is Kadabra who gets one shot by a bone club. <laughs> yeah these guys might have great special stats but their physical defence is absolute trash. <laughs> Seconds later Alakazam is down by a gill toss. Job done. Before setting sail, we grab the last of the PP Ops from Cycling Road and the Power Plant. Heh, <laughs> don't mind me, birdie, just passing through. But just like its stats sets as metronome PP cannot be raised any further, meaning 16 uses really is the most we can get out of it. We head through Diggler Cave and Pallet Town because sod going through that hell known as the Seafoam Islands, grab our final HM <laughs> intern and battle the penultimate gym leader, Blaine. This guy was tough. Although he only has three Pokemon, they're pretty high level and can hit us for massive damage. Needless to say, we get absolutely obliterated. I think it was on turn number 11 that we finally had this run. It takes a few rolls, but Ninetales is down to a Surf, then there's a lengthy exchange with Rapidash until we finally manage to cut it down. Last up is Arcanine, which is a whopping level 54, but he cools off to a Surf just as easily as the Ninetales did. Nice! We ride the hype train straight to the final gym leader, Giovanni. I was feeling really optimistic about this one, but he uses ground type moves like Earthquake, which are super effective against Pikachu. So, well... Yeah, this just wasn't happening, so there's only one thing for it. We need to grind some more. We take out pretty much every trainer left on the map and return at level 75, but is it enough? Is it? Mm, nope, definitely not. We keep farming at Cinnabar Island's Burnt Mansion until we reach a whopping level 80. Surely this has got to be high enough. Well, no. <laughs> what, what is this guy? <laughs> it's only after farming even more and using some rare candies that we had stashed that we finally had this run. We're level 88 and wipe out Dugtrio with a single dizzy punch. Persian's quickly down by a fire punch karate chop combo and the hellish Nidoqueen gets cured by a guillotine. 
Nido King is next, who we managed to flinch with bite and survive his earthquake. He's soon down to a vice grip. Then surprisingly, a simple absorb is enough to one-shot ride on. Haha, <laughs> job done. Oh, that was super exciting and a super tense fight. I was so happy I was just running around this room for a few minutes. <laughs> Alright, onto the Elite Four at the Pokemon League, but guess who's blocking our way? Yep, the rival's back and his team is even stronger now, but they're nothing compared to Giovanni. <laughs> Sand Slash is down to Razor Leaf, Execute is down to Cut Mega Drain, Magneton gets pounded into submission, Ninetales is quick to take down, Kadabra is, as always, a complete joke, and we dig a grave for our old pal Vaporeon. That was actually quite a fun fight, don't you think? <laughs> yeah, see, even Pikachu liked it. We push through Victory Road, nothing to report there, and finally arrive at the Indigo Plateau. Oh, by the way, does anyone know why Saffron City is the last option in the list of fly destinations? Like, here, we keep pressing up, 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 and Saffron City comes after the Indigo Plateau. Does that mean Saffron City was originally meant to be post-game content, or is it just yet another Gen 1 bug? <laughs> anyway, I have no doubt that the Elite Four will be able to easily destroy us, so we grind to level 100 before even attempting them. We deposit all HM users into the PC before going in so that you know there's no cheating going on here, and verse our first opponent, Lorelei. Remember, we're at max level and cannot raise any of our stats anymore, so there's no going back. The initial dugong is super tanky, alongside her super potions and its ability to fully heal itself with rest, it feels like we're going nowhere. That is until a super effective razor leaf finished it off. Cloyster is second, who is also very tanky and likes to trap us in endless clamps. Razor leaf could have saved us here, but it missed letting him continue with his multi-hitting shenanigans. Thankfully, a Dragon Rage allows us to push onto Slowbro. We get some good damage with Bone Meringue here, but then get super unlucky by rolling useless moves like Defense Curl. A Thundershock does eventually finish it off. Jinx is down to a Dizzy Punch, great, but Lapras is just too tanky and we run out of PP. Ah, so close. After a few more failed attempts, we have this run. We start with Thrash, which as discussed earlier, is brilliant for PP conservation. This and a Seismic Toss are enough to wipe out both the Dugong and the Cloyster. That's all very well, but how about Slowbro? Hmm. Well, we're still confused, so that comes back to bite us, but we live long enough to launch a Blizzard at him, plus a cheeky little bit of shock therapy. <laughs> Time for Jinx, which starts off very badly as we're put to sleep and repeatedly punched in the face. We debuff ourselves thanks to the Gen 1 Focus Energy bug and she's thrashing around. Luckily, a Sky Attack wipes her out before she can land the final blow, but how on earth will we be able to beat Lapras with only 14 HP remaining? Well, a Bone Club followed by a Critical Karate Chop. Yep, that ought to do it. We use a full restore and an ether in between fights, since using items outside of combat is okay by the rules. This guy, oh, we don't talk about him, oh no, no, no. To be honest, I was expecting an easy fight here, and that's exactly what we got. Onyx goes down to a dig, Hitmonchan gets kicked, Hitmonlee gets wrapped and clamped, and then we're on to the second Onyx. This one was quite a bit tougher due to its higher level, frequent X defense, and our very unlucky rolls, but its offense was poor. Even Earthquake Belly scratched us. <laughs> we just to say hit orange health by the time we land the critical vice grip. Machamp is next, who I expected to be super tough, but nah. He gets us low and then goes down to a hyper beam. <laughs> Beaten on the first try. Now on to Agatha. I already knew going into this fight that it would be incredibly frustrating, mainly due to all of her ghost types. For example, on our first attempt, yep, even Pikachu doesn't want to be here. <laughs> but after a while, we finally had this run. Level 56 Gengar is up first, and after a useless withdraw, we launch a powerful Ice Punch, meaning Agatha is now the one doing the withdrawing. <laughs> Golbat's out and gets one shot of the Hydro Pump. 
Back to Gengar, and here Fire Blast wipes him out. Nice. Oh, we're getting some great moves here. Haunter now, Blizzard. <laughs> wow, what is this look? Arbok takes a bit longer, but is soon down to a Thunderbolt. Against the more powerful level 60 Gengar, though, things have slowed down. Pointless moves like Double Team and Toxic waste our PP, but we somehow break out of the confusion for a Psychic, soon followed up by a Seismic Toss for the win. Yep, normal type moves don't affect Ghosts, but fighting type ones are totally fine. <laughs> Makes sense. <laughs> Time for Dragon Trainer Lance. Attempt number one, and we roll an explosion. <laughs> Ouch. Attempt number two, and we're hyper beamed out of there. Attempt three, hmm, same thing. Attempt four, ice beamed. Meh, well, at least it was something different. <laughs> Attempt number five, we're hit with an early hydro pump, but Gyarados goes down with Thunderbolt. Dragonair is next, who is weak to ice, and that's exactly what he gets. Second Dragonair, and we do get Hyper Beamed, but our multi-hitting attacks finish the thing off. Alright, two left. We inflict confusion on Aerodactyl before tossing and punching it, but Lance comes in with the Clutch Hyper Potion. String Shot? No, that's not what we need. We spend more time faffing about before tanking another Hyper Beam, knocking us down to just 8 health. And that's when we luckily roll a critical thunder for massive damage. Nice. Okay, last up is Dragonite, who is a whopping level 62. We roll a rest. Mm, not what I was hoping for, because we're low on PP, but I suppose health is needed. We're then forced to tank a fire blast and a blizzard before waking up. Hyper Beam misses, nice, but our guillotine does the same. Jump kick, uh, not very effective. We have one PP left, so this is our last move. Come on, bite. Yes, let's go. Oh, but we're not finished with the game just yet. Oh, no. We still have two super difficult battles left ahead of us. Yep, you heard that right. Two. This is it, our rival, the Pokemon League champion. First attempt, and we get instantly destroyed by a critical earthquake. <laughs> Ouch. Second attempt, and we make it a bit further before being stomped on the head. Third attempt, Pikachu CBA and just explodes. But that's when this fourth attempt began. We kick things off by Razor Leafing Sandshrew for the easy one shot, followed by a critical karate chop to one shot Alakazam. Alright, nice, let's keep up this momentum. We pound Executor but get Leech Seeded. Luckily, we body slam it out of there, but the health draining effect of the leech seed will sadly persist for the rest of the fight. Ninetales now, who we wrap, but this just procs the leech seed drain more time, so it's kind of a double edged sword. Thankfully, a bone meringue finishes the job. Magneton now, who is easily taken down by Skullbatch and Confusion because Magneton is not steel type in Gen 1. Last up, Vaporeon. We start with a Haze, which basically does nothing, and drop down into double digit health as we give it a gentle scratch. Flamethrower next, meh, critical, but not very effective. Next up is Body Slam, and yes, <laughs> we did it! We took down our rival, became the Pokemon League champion, and completed the game. Can you beat Pokemon Yellow with only Metronome and a single Pikachu? Heck yeah! But out of curiosity, are we strong enough to also defeat Professor Oak? For anyone who doesn't know, the Professor Oak fight is a legitimate piece of cut content from the Gen 1 games, and he is arguably the strongest trainer in the entire game. Here are the Game Shark codes if you want to try the fight for yourself. Let's rock. First up is his level 66 Taurus. Yeah, Oak has the highest level Pokemon in the entire game. <laughs> Fly and Bubble Beam get him down to red health, and then a clamp seals the deal. Level 67 Executor is next and Tackle isn't doing much, but Dizzy Punch and Fury Attack are enough to finish it off. Now for the level 68 Arcanine. This one gets a nasty critical takedown on us, but we're quick to wipe it out with a Crab Hammer. Blastoise now, who lowers his head for a Skull Bash, but we throw sand in its face, meaning it misses its next two attacks. Nice! We critical blizzard the thing before pushing onto his final Pokemon, the level 70 Gyarados, and we only have 2 PP remaining. 
Thankfully, Pikachu comes in with a clutch thunder for the win. Oh, that was a really fun challenge run, and certainly one I won't forget anytime soon, so thanks for coming along for the ride. Now, I think it's time for Pikachu's well-earned holiday. See you later, everyone. Cheers. Damn, I am trash at this surfing minigame. <laughs> Senpai, you should like and subscribe.